and welcome to CBMC's English Worship Service. And if you're visiting with us for the first time, we would love to connect with you. You can go to our digital bulletin at en.cbmcla.org slash bulletin and fill out our digital welcome card. Now, let's ascribe worth to the King of all creation. Oh 
Please turn to our announcements at en.cbmcla.org slash bulletin. And if you'd like to receive baptism or become a CBMC member in our September ceremony, we've extended that deadline until the end of the month. 
So please sign up on that bulletin in order to take that prerequisite life series class. This upcoming Saturday, July 17th, students and young adults are going to have a worship night. And it starts at 7.30 p.m. You can RSVP on that digital bulletin too. Next week, Dr. Chloe Sun from Lagos Seminary will be teaching a Zoom Christian education class at 10.15 to 11.15 in the morning. The class is going to be on Song of Songs, and she recently published a book on Song of Songs called Conspicuous in His Absence. And all are welcome to join. And lastly, there's a link on the digital bulletin for giving to the general fund and the missions fund. Before we preach, let's repeat aloud what the word says about itself. Deuteronomy 6.6 6. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would write your laws upon our hearts and make our lives a living testimony of your word. And we pray that our children would notice. You are a teacher today and every day. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. When Kobe Bryant entered the NBA, he was just 18 years old, coming straight out of high school. He said this. It was a rough couple years for me coming to the league, because at the time the league was so much older. It's not as young as it is today. So nobody was really thinking much of me. I was a, you know, a kid that shot a bunch of air balls, you know what I mean? And at that point, Michael provided a lot of guidance for me. You know, I truly hate having discussions about who would win one-on-one and your fans saying, hey, Kobe, you beat Michael one-on-one. I feel like, yo, what you get from me is from him. I don't get five championships here without him because he guided me so much and gave me so much great advice. Michael Jordan once said he didn't think he'd lose in a one-on-one -on -one match to anyone except, quote, other than Kobe Bryant because he steals all of my moves. Kobe imitated Jordan. Kobe once said about that imitation that it was near 100% of Michael's technique. And years later, another younger basketball player said, I watched every single thing Kobe did, Jordan did, and I tried to emulate it. What we see in this basketball education of Kobe Bryant and this other younger player and from how they mimicked Jordan, it's really identical to how Jesus looked at education. You see, there's two vastly different ways to learn. One way is to learn content. The other way, the way Jesus taught and the way Kobe learned, was to learn a person. We're preaching on stories about Jesus for the summer. So let's go back to the foundation of our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, we're going to ask the question, how did Jesus do formal and informal education? And we're going to take a look at a variety of passages and teach on the Jewish system of education. What we know about Jewish education was written about 200 or more years after Jesus. And this is going to be problematic because a lot of it were stories that were passed down from one generation to another. And this is called the oral tradition. And the hard part is this. The oral tradition about, Jesus, about Jewish education, did it happen that way during Jesus' time? Or did it happen that way after Jesus' time? Especially after the temple was destroyed in the all-important year of 70 AD. I'll try to paint a picture, but it's possible that some of the details occurred after Jesus' time. Now, most villages had a local rabbi, and you'll see that Jesus taught as a rabbi. He thought like a rabbi. And though he was kind of unconventional, and that's something that we'll address later on, in Christianity today, there's really no parallel to a rabbi. When you hear the word rabbi, don't think about a pastor, because the job description was really, really different. Instead, think about a university professor, and then combine that professor with a lawyer and the job of a judge. Uh, some of these rabbis, well, they sit at the city gate and they judge lawsuits that came to them because they knew God's law the best out of anyone in that community. 
Let me explain how Jews did formal education in the first century. Track with me for a bit. Schooling in ancient times, well, it really belonged to the rich. Most kids would get the education, but around the age of 10 to 13, only a privileged few would continue on to that education. You see, the word school, or ironically, comes from the Greek word skole, which means leisure. So students, next time you go to school, look at your assignments as leisure, because the alternative is to go to work. Now, Jewish kids of elementary age, well, they started in what was called the House of the Book. And school took place in the synagogue. In Israel, there were no elementary schools outside of the Jewish synagogue. Education was all about the Bible, not math, science, not secular literature. The focus was on reading and writing and memorization word for word of Genesis through Deuteronomy. One famous rabbi described memorization this way, the teacher should strive to make frequent repetitions until they thoroughly understand the matter and are able to recite it with great fluency. Sounds like a wanna. After completion, this is where most girls would stop to prepare for marriage, and only high status girls would then continue on to their education. Now during middle school years, Jewish kids went to the house of learning, and they studied the rest of the Old Testament and then other teachers' interpretations of the law. And then children would sit on the floor at the feet of the teacher. And that would be an important phrase for rabbi discipleship. Upon graduation, boys would celebrate this, this junior high phase with a bar mitzvah ceremony. Now, after this stage, this is important. Most boys would then go back to the family business and learn there, like fishing. Only afterwards would school be for the privileged, like the top 1%. And this would be exclusive, more exclusive than even the Ivy League or Hong Kong universities. And this was called the House of Study. And you studied under an exclusive rabbi. Now you had to, you had to remember not just what the Bible said, but you also had to remember now what rabbis X, Y, and Z said about the Bible. And at this stage, the student was now called a disciple. One learned by traveling with a rabbi, and one's goal was to imitate this rabbi, like Kobe imitated the master. This education continued until the disciple became a rabbi himself at about the age 30. So we're looking at 18 years of education. And this was the Jewish system of formal education. There were no colleges. There were no high schools. There were no, no trade schools. You learned from your families. It was just rabbis and disciples. We see this formal education in the Apostle Paul when he said in Acts 22, 3, I am a Jew educated at the feet of Gamaliel. That was his rabbi. Okay, so now with this background, how did Jesus do formal and informal education? So the first point we're going to make is that Jesus learned from no rabbi. You see, the Jews and the rabbis believe that in order for anyone to be a rabbi, he must first study under another rabbi. You don't get to be a rabbi unless another rabbi ordains you, generally through the laying of hands. Which is why the Jews contemptuously said of Jesus in John 7, 15, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? And since Jesus never learned at the feet of another rabbi, he shouldn't be teaching. That was what they believed. Jesus would have understood this as a Jew. At age 12, we have only one story about Jesus' adolescent years, and it has to do with his education. It's the Passover, and his family made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Now, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he was... 12 years old, they went up according to custom. Now, when this week-long festival was over, this crowd of 2 million people that flooded into the city of Jerusalem, well, they started going home, returning northeast, south, and west. And these families would travel together in one massive caravan, which is how no one probably noticed where Jesus was. One day later, after traveling, Mary and Joseph looked at each other and wondered where Jesus was. Maybe they thought that he was last walking with this cousin or that nephew. 
Well, Mary and Joseph then hiked back to Jerusalem, and where do they find Jesus? It says, in the temple. But notice what Jesus is doing. They found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, the rabbis, listening to them and asking them questions. This wasn't just any Bible study group. This was formal education for boys, again, 12 years and older, again called the house of study. Jesus, without his parents' knowledge, enrolled himself in higher learning under the study of a rabbi. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Jesus was surrounded by, let's say, 10 or 20 other students and one other rabbi, and he would have been one of the younger disciples in the class, and he was schooling everyone else. Mary then interrupts the class. Son, why have you treated us so? We've been looking everywhere for you. You don't know how stressful this has been for us. And look at Jesus' response. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Jesus was expecting to be in the temple with a rabbi. But instead, this happens. And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. Jesus gave up his formal education and he submitted to his parents willingly. And maybe they had no money to leave him in Jerusalem and maybe they needed Jesus to work to help out with the family. In either way, Jesus never learned at the feet of a rabbi. And this would have enormous consequences, just like any of you, for whatever good reason, didn't finish college. Later, in Jesus' 30s, he would end up teaching in the temple, similar to all these other rabbis. And the educated elite looked at Jesus contemptuously as one who never learned formally. So whether you went to a prestigious school or a not so prestigious school, or maybe you never finished school, the good news is that Jesus would become the most influential rabbi ever without formal education. Now, one day in his 30s, this unordained rabbi decided it's time to be a rabbi. And the practice was for students to approach a rabbi and to ask to be taught by him. And this is what's happening in Luke 9, 57, when somebody said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And after asking the rabbi, the rabbi would either accept or reject him based on his evaluation. And surprisingly, Jesus didn't really do it that way. Instead, we read statements like this. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. Well, how did Jesus do formal education? Second, he recruited. He chose his disciples. His disciples did not choose him to be the teacher. Luke wrote that Jesus prayed all night before choosing the twelve. Never in the scriptures does it really tell us how Jesus chose the twelve, which criteria did he use. But the point is this, that God's choosing is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Furthermore, being chosen to be Jesus' disciple, it changes you psychologically. The doctrine of predestination is partly intended to be a doctrine of encouragement. Jesus chose you. Jesus wanted you. When Caleb was seven, he was playing soccer with AYSO, and AYSO evaluates every player in July before the season starts. They give them a score of one to five, five being the highest, and then coaches pick teams with the fives getting picked first. And this evaluation process is how AYSO achieves their core value of having balanced teams so there's not a super team. I remember on the first day, the coach was excited to meet Caleb, rushed out, shook out his hand, stuck out his hand to shake him, and he says, this is Caleb, right? And then the coach informed me that Caleb was the number one pick of the whole draft. I looked at the coach thinking that this was some kind of joke, and I blurted out, this guy? He reassured me that Caleb was number one. Caleb's soccer skills now were just slightly above average, but nowhere near number one. And then back then, he cared more about making armpit fart noises rather than actually playing soccer. Someone made a huge mistake. 
And it was pretty clear on that Caleb was maybe the fourth or fifth best player on the team, not number one. But being the number one pick, it changed me psychologically because as a dad, I believed in Caleb more. I got him to practices earlier. I encouraged him more from the sidelines. And I did this knowing that he wasn't worthy of being the number one pick. In the same way, we'll do things differently when Jesus looks at us and says, I'm picking you to be my student. Come, follow me, learn from me. The third way that Jesus did formal education, now notice whom Jesus recruited. Those that were actually previously rejected. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. We read this story a little too literally with Western eyes and think, how did they just drop everything and follow Jesus? Now, read this story with the rabbi-disciple background instead, and it's going to feel different. Remember, these fishermen, they stopped learning at around what age? 12 to 13. They didn't make the cut. Their past rabbis didn't think that they were good enough or smart enough to continue learning, and thus... When this rabbi Jesus came up to them and recruited them and chose them in front of their own dad and gave them the opportunity to keep learning, they would have seen this as a huge honor. Let me give you a little bit of some perspective here. One of the top rabbis during this time was Rabbi Hillel, and it's said that he had about 80 disciples over his career. So to be in that kind of elite company was huge. Because when a rabbi asks you, you drop everything because your status just skyrocketed. It was said that rabbis outranked even family because, quote, your birth father brought you into this world, but your teacher brings you into the next world, end quote. So dad Zebedee, he wouldn't have complained to his friends that his sons left him to do all the work by himself. No, He'd be bragging with a proud smile. My sons, James and John, they're off being disciples with Rabbi Jesus. Sometime later, after Jesus ascended into heaven, the disciples themselves would become teachers. That was part of the process. Now notice, when it was their time to teach, look at the other rabbi's reaction. Now, when the Jewish leaders saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And some were pleasantly surprised. Some were mortified. When Jesus does formal education, he doesn't look for the best and the brightest. He recruited those who were common, those who felt the sting of rejection, those who were once excluded. In the NFL, players who are drafted higher get more prestige and more money. And then those that get drafted lower, well, they get less of that. And sometimes the guy who's rejected can actually become the best. The person with the most points ever in the NFL was never, ever drafted. That's Adam Vinatieri, a kicker out of South Dakota State, not known for their football program. Vinatieri said, I knew I wasn't going to get drafted. I had a couple of teams that said, we're not going to draft you, but expect a phone call as maybe a free agent after the draft. He said, I was available by phone, but it just didn't ring. He had to end up playing in Europe for a year before getting a chance to play with the Patriots, and it worked out okay for him. He ended up with four Super Bowl rings and a record 29 game winning kicks. Jesus took disciples who knew they weren't getting drafted by other rabbis and he used them to turn the world completely upside down. And so no matter your own ability or your past, Jesus is recruiting you to learn from him. And the fourth way that Jesus did formal education, well, we see that he taught imitation is actually learning. Luke 6.40 a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Jesus continued being an unconventional rabbi. And first, compare the content that the average rabbi would have taught. 
The conventional rabbi taught that precision of the law over hypothetical situations like this were, oh, this is what they did. Matthew 22, 25. Now there were seven brothers. Brother one married his wife and then died. Brother two married that brother one's wife and then died. And all the brothers repeated this. And in the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? The Mishnah is loaded with these kind of debates. And Jesus didn't teach this way. And frankly, most of us don't care. Instead, Jesus' lessons were for the common person. He would say things like, the kingdom is like a seed. He didn't have debates. Uh, the part where Jesus was, was conventional and the part that is most foreign to us in 2021 is that Jesus, as a rabbi, would have expected imitation. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The interesting part is truth is not a concept like it is for us in the Western world. Truth, according to Jesus, is a person. And thus, just like Kobe, you don't learn a concept, you learn the person. Disciples imitate their rabbis in every way. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And the fifth way that Jesus did formal and informal education, here he commissioned. Now, the disciples were tasked to make other disciples. And this was a normal process in Jewish education. Nothing unconventional here. However, under normal Jewish practices, students would study for years under the rabbi before being able to get to that position of teaching. And they would only do that if they were worthy. Not with Jesus. These disciples, instead of 18 years studying under a rabbi, they got only one and a half to two and a half years with Jesus before being released. Jesus substantially shortened the learning process, and they were all commissioned. Also, under normal Jewish practices, students would be commissioned to become rabbis themselves, and then these disciples would take the rabbi's teaching, add their own understanding to it, and then raise up disciples themselves. And incidentally, Jesus said, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher. So only Jesus gets to be the rabbi. Disciples don't get to be rabbis with authority. But for us, the task of disciple making, that still exists. The recruiting still exists. The teaching and the learning and the imitation, that still exists. In other words, Jesus made the whole process of education and commissioning accessible to all, not just the privileged. You are all commissioned to join him in this formal and informal education of others. Now, take a look and notice how we do church today. And the question that I want to pose to you is, does the church today teach anything like how Jesus taught in formal and informal education? And clearly not. Today, we prefer the sermon to learn. But if the sermon is so effective, what was the sermon on two weeks ago? Today, we prefer content over application. But Jesus would ask, what did you do from last week's sermon on going to the other side? We prefer people with degrees to do the teaching. But if only elite people get to teach, where do non-degreed people get opportunities to teach and to get better at teaching and get commissioned? See, when you compare the modern church's way of teaching to Jesus' way of teaching, you'll notice we've actually turned church into our own university systems. We have classrooms. We have lectures. We have electives. We don't really remember the content from most classes. And instead of imitation, the goal is to discover ourselves. We give our schools higher ratings if the teaching is entertaining and lower ratings if it's boring. You just don't see this model anywhere with Jesus. In order for us to do teaching Jesus' way, we would need to go through some massive changes. Jesus is inviting you to be a disciple. Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Let's pray. Jesus, you are the rabbi, and we long to model our lives after you. We desire to follow you in everything, and may you constantly teach us. We thank you that you have chosen us to be your disciples and to carry your teachings to other people. 
May we baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. May we teach them all that you have commanded us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
And let's bless one another with these words. Say Psalm 29, 11 out loud. And may the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Well, thank you for worshiping with us and blessings to you for the rest of the weekend.